Good afternoon. Thank you very much for coming on this very lovely afternoon. Um, so, I should explain what I'm doing here and uh, what I want to talk about. Um, I'm going to start by turning myself around without breaking anything so that you can see me and I can see you. Is that better? Um, this is really a, a rerun of a talk that I did at the BRLSI um, a few months ago. They asked me to talk about painting in 18th century Britain, and they gave me less than an hour to talk in. Uh, so I've tried to concentrate on just a few aspects, just a few personal thoughts, and I thought that... Um, as some of you were kind enough to come to that talk, um, and not all of you were able to come, I thought you might like to hear it anyway. Um, it's uh, a lot. It's a lot to squeeze in, so I'd better get on with it, uh, because obviously it's an enormous subject. Um, I'm starting with Thomas Barker, and the reason I'm starting with Thomas Barker's self-portrait is because I think it says so much about painting as a profession in the 18th century. Barker is right at the end of the century. He's 26 in this portrait, an artist of great promise. And people thought he was wonderful. People were so excited about him and what he was going to do. He was going to take art into the 19th century and represented a glorious future for British art. This is what um, Sir Edward Harrington, who's of course another Bath family, this is what he wrote about him. The young man is of first-rate genius and truly wonderful at so early an age. His style is so fine, bold and various, his design so correct, and nature, which is his model, so closely imitated that in his pictures the great masters of antiquity appear revivified to paint again. The reason I've given you that quote is because it says so much about what people thought made a good picture, what people thought made a good artist at this time. So he's innovative, he's a first-rate genius. But he also looks to the past. Um, so Harrington says, uh, great masters of antiquity appear revivified to paint again. He imitates nature. Nature is his model. And he also, uh, he looks at nature, but he also looks at famous works of art. And you can actually see this in the details of his self-portrait. Barker strongly identifies with Britain and with Bath, but he follows continental models, he follows the old masters. So he used his identity as an artist to enhance his social status. He was considered, as I said, by the, the media thought he was wonderful, they thought he was a genius. His father had been in debt, his father um, had uh, fallen a long way down the social ladder and got himself out of trouble through painting and Barker, even more so, um, the family were able to move to Bath. And Barker uses, Thomas Barker uses painting for his, um, to enhance his social status. He represents himself as a poet or intellectual rather than a craftsman. So as you see in, in his hair here, that sort of poetical um, kind of hair, he's associating himself with a generation of young artists, young poets, young creative people um, associated with the French Revolution. If you know, for instance, the portraits um, of uh, Coleridge and Southey from this sort of time, they've got um, similarly long hair. But he's also looking to the past. So he looks in particular to Van Dyck, 
This is the portrait by Van Dyck in the National Gallery. You can see how much Barker's portrait owes to this. And Van Dyck, who was working in mainly the 1630s in London, he represents a much more glamorous age, the days of yore, the court of Charles I before the Civil War. So um, a long time ago, before England changed. So there, Barker's got his long wavy hair, like the boys in the Van Dyck portrait. Notice his use of the golden coloured doublet as well. And most particularly that elbow in your face. So another elbow here, that's, that's very Van Dyck. And of course, Van Dyck gets it um, from, from Titian and, and other earlier masters. Here is Van Dyck himself doing a similar thing with his own self-portrait turning round like that. So Barker is also wanting you to think about Van Dyck's sunflower self-portrait. I'm showing you also a detail of what he's got on his canvas. He's got the amazing waterfall at Tivoli, an extraordinary work of nature. But above this extraordinary work of nature is a work of art, the so-called Temple of Vesta, which of course is an ancient Roman thing. So he is um, referring in his work to nature, but also to man-made works of art, to ancient things, but also looking towards the future. Written, as we've seen in the, um, the sort of funny extra addition to the Canaletto exhibition, we've seen there how the British were trying to project themselves as heirs of the Roman Empire. They have inherited the virtues of ancient Rome and the classical tradition. So the British Empire is becoming the new Roman Empire. And so British artists very much want to show their link to ancient classical culture. The other thing, of course, that he's showing off here is the fact that he's been to Italy. He's been on a grand tour, uh, which is a very, very good thing to have on your CV if you're an artist. Barker is um, a very consciously British architect, uh, sorry, artist. His subject is Britain and the landscape of Britain. Um, this is a little landscape which we have upstairs. Um, it's only about this big, so you could well miss it. Local landscape of view over um, Longleat. Um, he's also very interested in the people who live in the landscape, people like the blind beggar who you see recurring several times in his early work. This is a real person who wandered around Bath and, and who you could have met. He's also very interested in poverty and labour. He's an artist with a bit of a social conscience and that's also a very important aspect of British art at this time. Compare something like this with something like this from a hundred years earlier. So this is about 1685. It's the Lord High Treasurer, Earl of Rochester. Um, you can see a bit of Barker's self-portrait in it. He's doing that same elbow thing. Um, he's got the, the long hair. Obviously here it's, it's a wig. Um, but uh, it's also very different from Barker's portrait. It's very formal. Um, he's very formally dressed in this ridiculous garter regalia, which looks very uncomfortable. And what this painting is really about is the likeness of a very important person, the weight of him and the wealth of him and all those very expensive materials, the gold, the lace, the velvet, um, the ostrich feathers. Can you imagine how much it would have cost to bring feathers off an ostrich from the African desert to bring them to England. So what I'm trying to look at is what artists are for, really, because by 1600, painting techniques, drawing techniques have really been perfected. You can, if you're clever enough, you can get a perfect likeness. So likeness in itself isn't enough. The artist needs to be able to do more. You can't just copy what you see. 
in other words, a painting has to point beyond itself to something more profound than the thing that you can see in front of you. Artists need to take what you can see and transform it into something beautiful that will affect the person who sees the picture. Um, Reynolds writes a lot about this, about art as not just imitation, but ideal imitation. Imitate, imitating something, but making it look as beautiful and as meaningful as it possibly can be. So I'd like to sort of go back a bit into the 17th century to look at what painting is for. Painting, uh, the theory of painting was very much dominated by the academies, particularly the French Academy, who set up a hierarchy for different kinds of painting. And at the top of the hierarchy, you have pictures which tell stories, history painting. Great events must be represented as by historians or like the poets, subjects that will please. And climbing still higher, he must have the skill to cover under the veil of myth the virtues of great men in allegories and the mysteries they reveal. So the emphasis is very much on the human figure and human figures acting out a story. In the Baroque period of the 17th century, art isn't considered to be art unless it contains figures or tells a story. All the rest, um, landscape, architecture, um, still lifes, anything else that might appear in a picture, these are just context or ornament. And these are the conventions that the British don't like. They are stuck in these conventions at the beginning of the Georgian period, but really trying to break out of them. One of the problems with painting in Britain have our friend Willem Wissing, Dutchman, Michael Dahl, Swedishman, Gottfried Neller, who is German, so from the south they paint history pictures and from the north they paint portraits and also landscapes. So the great names in landscape at the beginning of the Georgian period are people like Jan Sieberechts, Leonard Neff uh, and the Val Van de Velde brothers who, who uh, dominate maritime painting at the end of the 17th century. Why wasn't Britain producing its own artists? Well, one reason is that painting just wasn't at the top of the cultural agenda. It wasn't considered as important as poetry, architecture, science, which were all very respectable, very gentlemanly things to do. Painting was still regarded essentially as a craft. There wasn't a reliable system of training. And there wasn't a tradition of British art for British artists to follow. And perhaps most importantly, there were actually very few places where you could see paintings. For most people, the only painting that they would see in their entire life would look something like this one. We didn't have paintings in churches very much, um, unlike on the continent. Uh, we didn't have sort of great sort of public buildings as they did on the continent. It was very difficult to see paintings. So let's just look at particularly history painting and why that was such a problem for the British. Well, basically because there is so little demand for it. Um, there are no vast palaces. There are no new churches which are built for paintings. The new sort of churches, if you think of the of, of the churches of the beginning of the 18th century. They are built to be very simple. They often have lots of windows, completely unsuitable for paintings. And of course, old churches had had all their paintings ripped out of them or whitewashed over at least a 100 years beforehand. So there are very few paintings to study at first hand. There are a few exceptions, like James Thornhill, who is actually British, um, and he gets some quite serious history commissions at the beginning of the 18th century. 
So this is his ceiling for the Great Hall at Greenwich Hospital, and uh, he also decorates St Paul's Cathedral. Um, so he works quite closely with Christopher Wren. So we've just heard how a painter who only does portraits still does not have the highest perfection of his art and cannot expect the honour due to the most skilled. British artists, because of this, they don't feel they can be taken seriously because they don't paint history. But nobody needs history painting, so you can't be a serious painter because the kind of paintings that you need to be a serious painter aren't wanted. So they're in this very difficult situation. And a lot of artists do eventually try their hand at history painting, and very few succeed, partly because it's not financially viable. History paintings have to be big, they have to include a lot of figures, um, they have to have a, a complicated composition. So you need to invest an awful lot in a picture that probably nobody's going to buy anyway. Occasionally they work. Here's one which really, really does work and was hugely successful. Um, Death of General Wolfe by Benjamin West, who some people might argue isn't British anyway, because he came from America. Um, what's so interesting about this picture is it's a completely modern subject. It was something that had happened just a few years before in a recent and indeed ongoing conflict. Um, so it would be like us now making a painting of an event in Afghanistan, say. Um, people in modern dress, but using a very traditional model. He has taken the tradition of the Pietà, and instead of Christ, you have General Wolfe, surrounded by um, soldiers instead of his family, and um, these very poetically painted figures. So this flag here, um, that would be like uh, the cross. Imagine if you had a, a picture of the descent from the cross. Um, so you're meant to think of that iconography when you see this picture. And it's meant to make you think what a hero General Wolfe is, what a tragic hero he is, how he gives his life for Britain, he gives his life for the Canadian people, represented by this sort of mohawk character here. Um, so the picture has a very strong patriotic, a very strong British message. So if you can't paint history paintings because nobody wants them and they're too expensive, how can you achieve that highest perfection whilst limiting your output to doing boring things like pictures of rich people's wives and country estates. Well, the British are very clever. They do several things, um, so that by the early 19th century, British painting is admired all over the world. Firstly, artists need to be properly trained. They need to have a proper professional structure. You also need to get more people interested in art. You need to create a demand for good painting. And then, if you can't paint history paintings, you need a new approach to those mundane subjects like portraits and landscapes to make them more exciting. So let's have a look at some of those solutions. Training was really, really important. Um, here is a page from Diderot's encyclopedia. It shows you the tools and the techniques of painting. And don't these painters look beautiful? They're so elegant. This little man here painting this lovely lady, another one up a ladder, um, working on a big canvas. Painting was actually quite a messy business. You had to do a lot of preliminary work. You had to stretch your canvas. You had to prime it. You had to grind and mix your paints. It was a lot of tedious manual work, but it was also highly skilled. And it's hard for painters to get people to recognize that combination of skill, imagination, and uh, sheer hard work. They want painting to be recognised as an intellectual pursuit as well as a manual one. 
And somebody who really gets people thinking about this is William Hogarth. Hogarth is a great innovator. There he is with his doggy. Um, he does so much to raise the status of artists and to help establish a homegrown British school. He is very, very patriotic. He hates foreigners, especially the French. He hates foreign art, or he pretends he hates foreign art. He's convinced that Britain can be a serious cultural rival to France and Italy. And he was working very hard behind the scenes to create opportunities for British artists. So he, he supports teaching. He also sets up uh, copyright laws to protect British, British artists from pirate printmakers. So um, a, a printmaker could copy a painting illegally. He could then sell prints um, using your visual property um, and make money from your visual idea. And so he lobbied Parliament for legal protection for artists and got artists recognized as the originators of an image. And that meant that you couldn't then engrave a picture without the artist's permission. He also finds new places to exhibit art. So this is one of the paintings that he makes for the Foundling Hospital, of which he's a founder patron, or a founder governor, rather. Um, the courtroom at the Foundling Hospital is a fashionable place for people to visit, not just to see the foundlings. Um, strange what people did, on, did in their spare time, but you would, you would go to the Foundling Hospital and you would look at the foundlings and uh, listen to them singing hymns in the chapel. And uh, you would also then go and admire the paintings that were given as gifts to the hospital. So Hogarth was very clever in that way, finding new ways for people to consume art. This is the St. Martin's Lane Academy, which Hogarth had a, a sort of um, indirect hand in founding. Um, Artists were trying to establish a new system of training because until now, the only way to become trained as an artist was either as a gentleman amateur or a lady amateur um, or through an apprentice. An apprentice was a form of bondage. You were bound to your master for seven years and you had to work for him for those seven years. And you had to do all the boring stuff, all the drudgery, um, and you didn't learn much. The, at the other sort of end, you then had to deal with patrons. And the trouble with patrons is that you're relying too much on a single powerful individual, his taste, his requirements. It means that you can't sort of experiment and try out new things. So gradually, these new schools start to emerge, which are managed on, on a very nice basis that you can go there and get lessons very cheaply. So um, a young artist can um, go to life drawing classes and uh, get a good balance of theory and practice from the various lessons that were on offer. Um, the St. Martin's one is particularly important um, because of the people who studied here, so Gainsborough was among them. And here you see a, a life drawing class going on um, with various theories about who these people are who are staring at you. The series of schools that appear in London is in, the, in the early to mid-18th century culminate with the Royal Academy which is founded in 1768, under the patronage of George III. Here is the extraordinary Dr. Hunter giving an anatomy lecture. So he's got a skeleton hanging up, and uh, he's got an écorché statue there. That's a, a chap who's had all his skin peeled off, made of plaster or something. And here's a real person, and he's showing you how the muscles move on a real live man a really important aspect of, of painter's training. And the wonderful thing about the Royal Academy was that 
it was free. The classes were free. And the way they financed the classes was through the exhibitions. They had a big summer exhibition. People paid to get in. They paid to buy catalogues. And with that income, they would set up these classes for pupils. There was no tuition fee, no entrance exam either. You worked your way through um, a quite a traditional curriculum um, with practical drawing classes, theoretical lectures like Dr. Hunter's here, um, and a team of really, really experienced professors. The other nice thing about the academy is that it encourages a sense of collegiality among the artists. So they're working together rather than seeing each other as rivals. Collaboration, not competition. Um, that's the theory, anyway. So it's like a professional association. And if you have RA or ARA at the end of your name, it's a sort of stamp of quality. On the other hand, yes, the Royal Academy does have a certain exclusivity. Um, and a lot of excellent artists either never joined the Academy, they didn't like the Royal aspect of it, or they fell out with the clique that ran it. So. Um, all our favourites, Gainsborough, Wright of Derby, Stubbs, they all fell out with the Academy, they all stopped exhibiting there. Um, so it wasn't quite as good as it seems at first. The other great teacher, for those who can afford it, was the Grand Tour. There are very few famous names from this period who didn't travel in Italy at some time. And the only real exception, do you know who didn't go to Italy? Thomas Gainsborough. He managed to get to Antwerp right at the end of his life, but that was as far as he went. Um, so in Italy, there is so much to learn. You can study the antique. You can draw ancient sculptures. You can study the old masters. You can copy the great masters like Titian and Raphael and Michelangelo. You can also learn from nature the wonderful landscapes and natural phenomena that you find there. And by the end of the 18th century, that's actually the most important reason for travelling, is to see the nature, not the man-made works of art. And the other thing that you study there is people. Uh, you meet the right people, you meet other artists, you meet the milordi, the, uh, the people with lots of money who are going on their grand tour, who are interested in collecting. They love art, they love collecting, so it's a chance to get to know your audience, to get to know the so-called connoisseurs and patrons of your time. So I mentioned before this idea of getting the general public interested in art, creating a market. Oh, sorry, I forgot my grand tour picture. There's my, my grand tour picture. You've all seen that before, I'm sure. Um, but there is a collection, a mixture of artists and very, very expensive patrons, um, all admiring the wonders of Florence, all crammed into one room. This is the Royal Academy exhibition in 1787. And what, two things I love about this picture, first of all, is like it's spot the picture. And there are so many famous ones. So there's Reynolds doing the Prince of Wales. Um, what else can we see that I can pick out for you and recognize? Um, lots of famous portraits and history paintings here. And if you look very closely around the fireplace, you might be able to spot the miniatures. That's where the miniatures went, down there. Um, the other thing I love is, is um, this group here. So you've got the Prince of Wales looking extremely grand, and he's being shown around by this rather small man here with an ear trumpet. This is Sir Joshua, who is the president of the Royal Academy, and then other members of the royal family, the royal household, with their various pets running around. Um, but the Royal Academy isn't just for royal visitors. Um, anybody can go there, and at this time, we're seeing the rise of the middle classes, the professional classes, bankers, brewers, industrialists, people who want to show off their politeness and their taste. Their identity is defined not so much by how much money they've got, but how they spend that money in engaging with culture. 
So if you can show that you're participating in culture, it guarantees you a place in polite society. So you need to be able to talk about what you saw at the theatre the other night. You need to be able to give your opinion of all these pictures at the academy, um, in all these drawing rooms and, and salons that you go to, to mingle with other like-minded people. You, the exhibitions are so vital as a place for people to see art. And uh, I mentioned before about the Foundling Hospital, which Hogarth was involved in setting up in 1739. And in Bath, we have an equivalent. We have the uh, Bath General Hospital, the Mineral Water Hospital, and uh, William Hoare in particular and his cronies are very good at using the hospital as a place to exhibit their pictures. This is one that he actually gives to the hospital and I put this in all of my talks, you're probably sick of seeing it now, but I just think it's so fascinating um, to have Dr. Oliver, you recognise him because you've eaten biscuits with his face on them, um, Jerry Pierce who's the surgeon and these three patients showing a variety of different ailments. And I love this little boy with his poor little hands with eczema all over them. I'm sure a lot of you sympathise with him. I certainly do. Um, Boxall Gardens. That's another place to see art. Um, the owner, Jonathan Tyres, commissioned paintings to decorate the supper boxes from some quite significant artists. Of course, the Royal Academy isn't the only place that does exhibitions in London. There's also the Society of Artists of Great Britain, which began about 1760. The first exhibition was in 1761, and quite a few of our pictures upstairs were exhibited at those early 1761-2-3 exhibitions in Spring Gardens. So the Royal Academy, I've mentioned, you also get commercial galleries like um, Boydell's Shakespeare Gallery, where he gets all the great artists, and some not so great, of his day to paint on big canvases scenes from Shakespeare. And he sticks them all in a gallery in, uh, I think it's in the, the Strand, and uh, you pay to go and look at these pictures, and you can also buy engravings of them, which you can bind into a book to illustrate your Shakespeare plays. Many similar in enterprises are happening in other cities. Liverpool starts having regular art exhibitions, York as well, Dublin. And Bath has the odd exhibition, but they never have any sort of regular thing going until the 19th century. There is an informal exhibition actually in an artist's studio. You can see the artist beckoning in his lovely lady sitter. Um, while the other people look at examples of his work. These sort of shows, as I've said, they become a social event and they cultivate an interest in art among the middle classes. They give artists a shop window. So you can buy direct from the artist. The artist can also test the market. He can put something in an exhibition, see whether people like it. If they like it, he can do more of the same. If they don't like it, he can try something different. Um, it gives the artist a lot more freedom, but of course he has to take the financial risk himself. If you make a picture for exhibition and it doesn't sell, um, what do you do with it? You've, you've invested all that time and money in a flop. But the exhibitions do create a demand for big spectacular history paintings, and they can be very lucrative. Um, people might not want that kind of thing in their house, but they will certainly pay to see them in a gallery, and they would certainly be happy to have engravings made after them. This is Christie's sale room. This is another really, really important place in London to see art from all schools, all periods. And London is really growing and becoming the great trading hub of Europe. The art market's sort of heart used to be in Amsterdam in the 17th century, but now it's moving to London. And if you want to see the great pictures, here they are at Christie's and other sale rooms. Many very important old master paintings pass through this room. The media also become more and more important in promoting art. 
newspapers, magazines. Um, it really helps if you're an artist to have a friend who is a journalist or a writer because very often they will write articles or poems about wonderful artists and their great works um, and everybody who reads these knows perfectly well the person who's written the article is not neutral, that he's actually either a great body of the artist or the artist has paid him some money to write it. And of course the print market is very essential to artists throughout the 18th century as a way of getting their work out there, getting their work known. My third solution to the British problem is what I've called genre busters. So things that are apparently in one genre, but actually finding ways of imitating history painting. This is what Hogarth discovered. The most effective paintings are the ones that imitate some aspects of history painting, but aren't actually history paintings. They combine elements of different genres to create something new. And that's a way of breaking out of those strict academic hierarchies. So one of them, and this is something very British, is the conversation piece. Um, conversation piece, it's a mixture of portraits and genre or everyday life pictures, but also they often have an element of history. They often tell a story. Sometimes it's quite a boring story, sometimes it's quite an interesting story. So in this case, the story is about the sisters marrying um, these two men here, so three families being united, all meeting up in India. Um, and it's a story that has great significance for the family because it helps to explain um, how their ancestry has come about and the importance of India in their family story. The origin of the conversation piece is partly in uh, French paintings, um, French paintings, particularly Rubens, uh, things like uh, these uh, fête galant sort of pictures. So very often um, a family like this wants you to think that you're looking at a kind of earlier French style fête galant sort of picture rather than a family portrait. Staying with Zoffany, this is another of these, of these genre busters which is Again, you look at this, you think it's a history painting. It's a very exciting scene from a play. Um, this man is about to murder his wife, and uh, she manages to persuade him not to, but he is so angry that he draws his dagger on her. But we know that this is a portrait. And again, this does very, very well commercially. Joseph Wright is doing a sort of um, haunt force nativity here, with the, except that the light, of course, is the lamp which has been placed in the orrery. Very clever copying the old masters in this way. Reynolds, as well, is a great one for mixing up the genres. So um, he um, he wants to make portraits sort of more exclusive. More and more people are having portraits painted. And because Reynolds is right at the top of the artistic hierarchy, he wants his, his paintings to look completely different from any other. So he disguises them as history paintings. The grand manor portrait, the portrait that looks not like Mrs. Musters, who was rather a naughty wife, but who looks like a Greek goddess, um, disguised as the cupbearer of the gods. Or... This is uh, not Reynolds, this is right, of course. I wanted to put this back in to remind you what's not here anymore. Uh, but uh, if you have a proper art collection, you really need a Madonna and child. And if you can't afford the real thing, then, of course, you can get your wife to do it. And it means that you get two for the price of one. You get your Madonna and child, but you also get your portrait of your wife and little, and boy, little boy. And it means that uh, it's all very British 
and uh, you don't have to have any of this sort of embarrassing god stuff in your picture. It's just a picture of your wife. Stubbs also, um, he likes to mix up the genres. Animal painting, as I said, it was one of the lowest forms of art. And Stubbs understands horses intimately, but he doesn't want always to be painting racehorses. Racehorses really only appeal to the racehorse owner. He needs to make pictures that will appeal to everybody. So he needs to give his horse a much more a grand status. He needs to turn it into the protagonist of a great tragedy. And to do that, he attacks it with this lion. And uh, in this series of pictures, the lion gradually approaches and uh, in many versions, the lion is actually on the horse's back, digging his claws in, uh, which is based on an ancient Roman model. So what he's doing is an, actually an ancient classical subject, but done in a very, very realistic way. So the horse is no longer somebody's property, it's no longer a status symbol, it's a wild horse who is the hero of his own tragedy. Finally, um, I should talk about how artists use nature in pictures, how they, they transform the way that, that nature is used. And just sticking with Stubbs, people are really getting to know and understand nature. Um, they're traveling much more and they're looking much more into things and how things work. So the science of botany is growing, the science of anatomy, zoology, ge geology, all of the, the, these sciences that look at how things work, what things are made of. And it means that artists are becoming much more observant. They're looking at things and looking at the actual substance of things. So here is a real live yak who lived in Gloucestershire in Warren Hastings House. Of course, he's in a setting um, again, taken from life by a traveller. This is a setting of a famous place in Bhutan. If any of you has ever been on a particularly exotic gap year, you may have visited this place. This is Joseph Wright getting really involved in rocks and really looking at how rocks are constructed. Um, Gainsborough as well. He spent days and days and days just studying grass and trees and undergrowth. Um, and drawing from nature really stimulates not only the eye and the hand, but um, it trains what they call the organs of sentiment. It's the idea that if you study the sublime in nature, you can actually improve yourself morally. So nature isn't just a purely physical phenomenon. It also has a moral and psychological dimension. Landscape is really becoming a subject in its own right, a subject that is being elevated much, much closer to the status of history painting. So here is Joseph Wright again, ignoring mostly the people. Um, there are some people here, but very often you'll see landscape where they have, they, you don't have to have people in a picture for it to be beautiful and meaningful. This is one of the things that they're discovering on. Um, in the 17th century, um, that quote I, I gave you before, he who represents human figures is much more excellent than all the others. Is he? Well, artists, as I said, they were going on the grand tour to learn about the classical canon, to learn about the old masters, and Joseph Wright was one of those ones who was bowled over by the natural landscape, not by the images of the human figure at all. So people get really excited about the landscape as a subject in its own right, as a serious art form in its own right. Richard Wilson is the same. And Richard Wilson studies his own Welsh landscape, the landscape of Britain, and makes this the subject of beautiful, uninspiring pictures. You don't have to go to Italy, you don't have to go to the Alps to see real natural beauty. And what about Constable? 
Constable's pictures, of course, are very nostalgic. He is aware that enclosures and urbanisation are destroying the traditional rural landscape and the traditional way of life. It's all slipping away and he wants to catch it. He wants to catch the landscape of his childhood. And so we begin to see the development of an English or British pastoral ideal. People used to think that Arcadia was Greece or Italy, something that looked sort of Italianate, as you see in the sort of 17th century pictures we have upstairs. Your landscape always has to look like something out of Italy. But people like Constable are showing that you can find beauty in your native countryside, um, the place where he grew up. And this is an extraordinary picture. It's, it's so beautiful. I love this picture. And yet the foreground is dominated by this vast dung heap. That is what that is. It's a big heap of dung. So these chaps, they're shoveling the dung on the cart. The cart goes down the hill, down this steep hill here, and it comes down into the valley. The dung goes onto the fields, and it makes the fields beautiful with waving corn. And what an amazing story. That's, you know, the story of, of, of the natural cycle, but... Um, it's the sort of great story of all time, isn't it? What about Turner? Um, he starts off very much as a topographer. He gives you the facts. Um, and he finishes up as president of the Royal Academy and maker of apparently Britain's favourite painting. Do you remember that poll on the Today programme? It's actually 10 years ago now they did this poll. And they found that the Fighting Temeraire was Britain's favourite painting. It's a sort of ghost ship, the Temeraire um, being tugged off into the sunset or away from the sunset. It's a very patriotic picture. Um, Turner is expressing everybody's pride in the victory of Trafalgar. It's like an old hero being laid to rest. And... There are so many metaphors here. This is a real history painting. Um, the sun setting on the great days of the British Navy. The contrast with this very dirty black tug, which sort of represents the new industrial world. Um, 19th century is a very dirty, smoky time, and the ship is a product of a more graceful age. Turner is actually using the natural environment of the Thames. He knows the Thames intimately. He spent his entire life by the Thames. And he uses the moods of the river to tell the story. But like those history painters of the 17th century, he's still using little tricks to help him tell the story. Um, so he's actually, this is actually going the wrong way. So um, the, the sun is setting on the wrong side of you, if you see what I mean, because the, uh, it's actually being tugged from the mouth of the estuary um, from east to west. And uh, so the sun's setting in the wrong place. Um, but Turner is an artist. Um, art is ideal imitation. It's not slavish imitation. It's imitation idealised. It's a very simple story. And yet, as a history painting, it's as thrilling and as moving as anything the old masters could produce. This is what Thackeray said. He said, this is as grand a picture as ever figured on the walls of any academy or came from the easel of any painter. Of course, not everybody liked Turner. Um, I don't like Turner either, as some of you may know. And I much prefer Beckford's quote. He says, he paints as if his brains and imagination were mixed upon his palette with soap suds and lava. One tiny little bit, because um, I, I, I need to add in one more thing, about the role of nature in landscapes. You can use nature, a landscape, sorry, nature in, in portraits. You can use a landscape in a portrait to help you tell the story. It's like a sort of background music if you like. So this is what's happening here. Gainsborough is using this very beautiful, very poetic landscape to affect the way that you feel about these people, to make you think that 
they're in a beautiful, natural place. They must be beautiful people who really appreciate this environment. People of great sensibility. Somebody who does this very, very well, I'm just going to skip our friend here, because that's got nothing to do with nature. Um, someone who does this really, really well is Thomas Lawrence. And uh, he really uses the landscape to kind of uh, crank up the tension in the background. If you imagine some sort of Beethoven playing here in this very stormy sky. Um, this is a, a coming of age portrait, like Garth Norm's picture. That's why I put them together. Um, but look how this, this young man is about 18. He's leaving Eton College. There's the college in the background there. He completely dominates the landscape. Um, he towers above this sublime view, and that's simply done by taking a very low viewpoint. Notice also how Lawrence has gone for a very stormy sky. It reflects the colours of his hair, the very dark colour of his eyes as well. And notice also that he's not depicted sitting in the school library. Had this been painted about 1700, he probably would have been surrounded by books and sort of draperies and nice furniture and things. He is roaming about the hills with the wind in his hair because this is 1791 and this is what young people are supposed to do in this, this new age. Um, a very heroic figure, very much like a statue come to life. Notice how there's a very strong line right through the centre of him, through the centre of his nose, all the way through his body and down through his leg, carrying this weight. So you've got this very statuesque, column-like, powerful figure. Now, recently, um, we found this. And this is Lawrence's study for that portrait. And um, I hope you like it, because we want to buy it. <laughs> And in order to buy it, we need a lot of money. So I'm going to hang this next week while we're taking the Canaletto down. Um, I'm going to hang it in the picture gallery. And we're going to start a campaign. And we're going to need your help with that because um, we've already had funding promised, very generous funding. I can't give you the figures because I'm useless with numbers. But uh, from the Art Fund, they promised to give us some money. The VNA have promised to give us some money. We are now applying to the HLF. That's the big one, and that's the difficult one, because that comes with a lot of sort of political strings attached. Where is it at the moment? It's downstairs. It's in the picture store downstairs, um, and has been for a couple of months. Um, so it's going up in the gallery next week. And uh, we're going to put a huge donation box in front of it, which will look horrible. But uh, we need a huge donation box to collect the huge amount of money that we need. So I, I really hope you like it. We think it's a, it's a beautiful picture. Obviously, the connection is that Lawrence studied in Bath as a young lad. He, well, he didn't study. He worked here. He, he came here when he was 11 or 12, his family had been running the bear in Devizes, the big inn in the marketplace in Devizes. And they came here, and little Tommy set up as a portrait artist. We've got those two sketches upstairs already on the mezzanine, which he did when he was about 14. He goes to London when he's 17, and he takes the Royal Academy by storm with pictures like the portrait of Arthur Athley. The same year he paints Arthur Athley, he is appointed painter in ordinary to the king. He is the successor of Sir Joshua Reynolds, age 22. So he's a pretty phenomenal artist. We think he's a phenomenal artist. We think this is a phenomenal picture. And um, yeah, I, I really hope you like it and that um, you can keep it. So fingers crossed. But um, in the picture gallery, um, they kind of move about there, but that's where it will go. And we don't have a Lawrence painting. We've got those two drawings, but we don't have a painting by him, which is silly, really, considering how important Bath was to Lawrence. So 
Thank you. I finished.